Hi everybody, I hope you're having a great start to your week so far. Tonight I'm going to review Serpent of Wisdom by Donald Tyson. I thought this was an excellent book and this is a book that I would recommend to just about anybody. I suppose you can never say everybody, but you know, I think most people would enjoy this book and get something out of it. So, okay, this book is about, it's about 275 pages, I believe. So, Serpent of Wisdom and Other Essays on Western Occultism by Donald Tyson. I'm going to go ahead and read the back cover for a um, quick synopsis here, and then I'll go deeper into the book. New Perspectives on Ancient Magic. Reconciling with rational thought, well-known occult scholar Donald Tyson presents an exciting collection of essays that offer fresh insights into a wide variety of important topics in the Western esoteric tradition. Along with practical instructions on the correct casting of the magic circle and the uses of familiars, Tyson includes a new system of coin divination and a complete history of the esoteric ordering of the tarot trumps. Here you will learn the hidden roots of magic, what it is, and how it works on the deepest levels of reality. So here are some bullet points here. What esoteric energy is and how to use it. The arcane meaning of the serpent of wisdom. The making and use of a book of spirits. The essential nature of spiritual beings. How we perceive and interact with spirits. The truth about spirit possession and why you should not fear it. The reality of vampires, werewolves, ghosts, and demons. A revolutionary manifesto of spirits' rights. Okay, so it was right around $17. Um, this book is put out by Llewellyn. Instead of reading the table of contents, I'm going to bypass the introduction and just uh, give y'all a brief overview of each of the chapters. So here we have chapter one, which is definition of magic. And um, this was a good chapter just to kind of recap. Uh, I believe in this book he goes over the differences between Western and Eastern uh, traditions of magic. Then he goes through history and gives a brief overview <clears throat> excuse me, of significant people. So here, here we have Pliny the Elder, the Book of Enoch. Let's see. Um, the Demonology of James, uh, King James the Sixth of Scotland. It gives a bunch of history about his influence on things. Raleigh's History of the World. Cornelius Agrippa. Reginald Scott. The Golden Bow, or Bow, Golden Bow, which I have not read that. Has anybody out there read that? I've seen several titles that reference this, and I've, I've never read any of them, so if anybody has any viewpoints on that, feel free to uh, put something in the comments below. Alistair Crowley. Israel Regardi and New Millennium Magic. Then we're going to go to chapter two, which is the magic circle. I thought this was a very good chapter. I did 
enjoy quite a bit of it. I'll read a little bit of what I highlighted here. All circles are, by their inherent nature, magical. They define order from chaos. There is no separation in the natural world. There are only the separations we choose to impose upon our perception of the natural world. In geometry, the circle is always perfectly round. Esoterically speaking, the circle can be any shape provided that it divides outside from inside. Indeed, the circle can be no physical shape at all, but merely a concept or idea. Then he talks about names being like magic circles, the occult power of names. Now, let's see. Goes on for a couple of pages. Circles of stone and dancing rings. He talks about a little bit about Stonehenge, and he mentions um, Gobekli Tep Tepe, which if y'all haven't heard about Gobekli Tepe, definitely check it out. It's quite fascinating. I have a book on that alone, um, particularly if you're into archaeology, you, you would like that. Magic Circles in the Grimoires. Drawing the physical circle. Mm. Oh, here's one where I highlighted a bunch. Projecting the astral circle. And I thought this was um, really good, what he put in here. And also, he talks about. The magic ring being like, like a circle. Um, circlets that you would wear on your head being magic circles. He talks about breaking the circle. Oh, here we go. Ring, sash, and circlet. That was good. And then he gives conclusions. Okay, then we get to the nature of spirits. Um, this was a good chapter. He talks about the different types of spirits, celestial spirits, terrest terrestrial spirits, um, infernal spirits, and uh, human spirits. I'm gonna zoom on ahead here. This is going to be a longer review because I think this book is worth it, really worth it. Chapter 4 is Serpent of Wisdom. This was a great um, chapter all about snakes and their, hist their history in different cultures. So here he talks about the serpent in the garden. And you would, it's not just the Christian perspective. He talks about it pre-Christianity, what it meant to different cultures. The Gnostics... The Gnostic Serpent. Uh, oh, he even talks about Pentecostal snake handling, which was that's come up a couple times recently. Serpent worship among the pagans. Okay, and then we get to familiars. <clears throat> I, I like a lot of his perspectives on familiars. I do have a whole separate book f by him on um, spiritual familiars. Some people may not like everything he has to say in this chapter, and I'm just going to leave it at that. I'm not going to get too deep into it. If anybody um, gets this book or wants to have a deeper discussion on that, let me know. Then we get to chapter 6, Vampires, Werewolves, Ghosts, and Demons, which uh, at first I wasn't going to take this chapter very seriously, but then when I started reading it, you know, he brought up several good points, so I thought this was a good chapter. Okay, 
Chapter 7, Gorilla Divination. That's where he teaches his um, form of divination using coins. So it's like divination on the go. When you're out and about. You could just have a few coins and do some divination. He gives pretty in-depth detail about that. Then chapter 8 is sensory metaphors. I don't remember getting a whole lot out of this chapter. Okay. Um, chapter 9, Order of the Tarot Trumps. This was a good chapter. Um, if you're very, very well versed in the history of Tarot, you might know all this, but um, I definitely found it quite interesting because he goes over what changes in the sequencing between the different systems, between the Golden Dawn, the Marseille Tarot. Uh, and, and he gives specific examples and talks about the different naming of things like uh, the, the female pope becomes the high priestess, the pope becomes the hierophant, um, but then the number, not only do names change between different systems, numbering changes between the different systems, and um, he does a really good job of explaining the, the different decisions and thought processes that went into each one of the systems. Okay, let's go on to the next chapter because this is already getting a little bit long. Time and magic. This is good. This is um, more about time from a string theory or metaphysical perspective, not, not a linear perspective, right? So if you're into string theory, metaphysics, you'll probably dig that chapter. <laughs> uh, chapter 11, the fairy godmother, which I was like, what? What's he really? How much can he say that he devoted a whole chapter to the fairy godmother? But he used as examples primarily Sleeping Beauty and Cinderella, and he really gave some history, some history and differences on each one of those that I didn't know, and I thought it was very interesting. It certainly was. Okay, then we get to chapter 12. Dun dun dun. Black magic. Uh, nobody freak out, okay? As a matter of fact, I think in the beginning of this chapter, uh, he, he, he notes that this tends to throw people, a lot of people off, and he says just because I'm writing about it doesn't mean I'm condoning it, blah, 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 okay? So then he goes into the history of black magic, different perspectives, who contributed to the different thought processes and things that came to lead to persecution of witches and whatnot. And, of course, King James pops up for that as well. Um, <clears throat> he goes into Agrippa. A.E. Wait. Uh, okay. I'm trying to scoot this thing along. This review along. <laughs> then chapter 13 was pretty interesting. He talks about the Book of Spirits, which would be different from a grimoire or um, a Book of Shadows or a magician's um, journal. <clears throat> that was really interesting. And he gives uh, how it was originally described in the grimoires, and then he gives a modern version of how to do one. So that was a really interesting chapter. Chapter 14, Esoteric Energy. I don't remember getting too much out of this chapter. I think I just highlighted the different 
I don't think I highlighted very much in that chapter at all. And then we get to chapter 15, Spirits Rights, a manifesto. And I thought this was really good, and that could be a whole another topic all on its own. And then chapter 16, he gets into the Enochian apocalypse working, <clears throat> which wasn't one of my favorite chapters, but you know, he does, each chapter he does do a very good job of covering history and giving credit where credit's due, and he'll, he'll always bring up something that I find at least a little bit new or interesting or a different take on things. Okay, so this is over 15 minutes. Um, I do recommend this book. If anybody is interested, I think it's definitely worth having in your collection. I can't imagine anybody really being too disappointed in getting this book. And so, yeah, I'm going to leave this one here. And I hope this finds everybody having a, a lovely evening. And I thank you for watching. And as always, I wish you many blessings. And I'll see you soon. Bye.